All right, well, um, welcome to everyone. And of course, especially Ms. Haynes for being willing to participate uh, in this interview with us today. Um, I'm gonna start actually um, by reading the bio that's in the back of your book. Okay. Um, it's uh, concise and uh, we wanna use our time wisely today. And I thought, well, this pretty much gets us uh, started, gives you a good frame of who you are today. So, and what you're doing today. Ms. Haynes is a criminal justice reform advocate and former Nashville public defender. She currently serves as a voting rights campaign strategist with the Sentencing Project and formerly served as the legal advisor to the nonprofit organization Free Hearts. In 2020, she campaigned with Hope 2020, y'all. That's not from the book part. That's not from the book, but uh, yeah, but in 2020, she campaigned with hopes to become the first black congresswoman to represent Tennessee. She lectures nationwide and lives in Nashville, Tennessee. It is an honor to have this opportunity to meet with, hear and learn from you, uh, Ms. Haynes. And while the bio in the book jacket is a perfect summary of who you are professionally, um, both what you have done and what you are doing, um, there is a personal history that creates the foundation of who you are today. And that personal story, that personal history is uh, provided for us in your book. Just heard a beep, I don't know what that was. Um, uh, so the book, Bending the Arc, uh, My Journey from Prison to Politics um, is a book that I was uh, excited to read. Uh, I, I don't even remember. Oh, actually, it was because you posted in the Girl Attorney Tennessee group about it. Um, so that's how your book came on my radar. And um, uh, just a second, sorry. I ordered it right away. Um, I thought it was kind of just a nice bonus for me personally that it was your published date was my birthday. So happy birthday to me. Um, and I started it at the beginning of last week. I had just a few minutes over a lunch hour and thought, oh my gosh, this book is going to be as well written as it will be interesting. And uh, I had to wait till the end of the week to pick it up again, but Friday morning I did. And uh, I did not put it down till I finished it. So that was, the lo that was the longest I've sat and read a book in my life, honestly. Like, absolutely. I know I never read a book I had to read uh, for that many hours at a time. And uh, it was just that good. Um, and uh, I found your book, both as uh, that your story was as compelling as your book was well written. And while in your story, what happened to you was horrifying, um, but it was wholly unsurprising. And this is where um, I have to confess, uh, because when this was happening to you 15 years ago, um, if someone had told me this was happening to you, I would have thought it was a mistake. I would have thought they were mistaken. I would have thought, well, if this really happened, this is an anomaly. Um, it was none of those things. And it continues to be none of those things. Um, it was through uh, reading and listening, uh, I'd say over the past, I don't know, just three to five years of my adult life, where I stopped and looked for the education and to learn from the experiences that were not otherwise handed to me, right? So I went looking and um, so what, what makes this important to me is this opportunity to um, learn more from you um, and also to um, provide an opportunity for others to learn from you as well. Um, whether people consider themselves an advocate for criminal justice reform, whether they, um, consider themselves suspicious of criminal justice reform, or they're just, if you're just curious, I don't understand why do people say that the color of your skin would uh, have make a difference? And why do people say that if you don't have white skin that you're treated disproportionately poorly? If you're curious, this book is an opportunity to learn. Um, and it's critical, I think, that we all are intentional about educating ourselves so that we can be better advocates for justice. I think probably most of the folks um, in this uh, 
call or this Zoom meeting, whatever you call it. Um, I think most people participating today are attorneys, but whether or not someone's an attorney, um, they have, we all have a voice where we can advocate for justice or not, right? So uh, with all that said, um, I would like you to first, um, if you would, Keita, um, and this is clearly no substitute for the book where um, I was thinking today, like zero words are wasted. You say so much and it's a whole book and we only have 30 minutes. Um, so this uh, interview is certainly no substitute for the book and forgive me for continuing to push this book which I'm sure you'll forgive me, Kita, but uh, any, anybody else who's like, come on, but it's very well told, very important story to learn from. Um, so with that, um, Kita, I would love it if you would start by telling people um, uh, an overview, um, your summary of your story. I have a lot of questions for you. Um, but they will make more sense in the context of you providing that story. So if you will, please go right ahead. All right, thank you, Susan, for having me. Um, thank you all for joining um, you know, this conversation. Um, when Susan reached out to me and asked if I would do it, I you know, didn't even think twice about it. You know, just love being able to be in the company of you know, other attorneys and particularly other female attorneys. Um, I do see that my friend Chris is on here. So um, you know, Chris, you're not a female, but you're an attorney too, so I love you. Um, but, you know, it, it's, it's just good to be here and to be able to talk about this. And Susan, thank you again for, you know, continuing to promote the book and for, you know, all of the great things that you said about it. So, um, you know, as, as Susan mentioned, I'm originally from Franklin. Um, and how all of this happened was that I was um, with my sister. My sister was turning 21 and um, I was 19 at the time. And we went out for her birthday and I met a guy when we went out Um he told me that, you know, he was from Memphis, but he was here in Nashville um, doing an internship and that was in the summer. And, um, you know, and so we developed a relationship over time. And, um, you know, within that relationship, um, you know, he asked me if I would be willing to accept cell phones and pagers for a business that he had with his cousins. And the reason why he needed me to accept those packages was because he said that no one would be at the store at the time FedEx would deliver them and that his cousin would come and pick the packages up and they would take them to the store and you know do what they need to do with it so I didn't think anything of it it sounded legit to me so I agreed and I signed my name to these packages um, several times so that some of my friends and turns out that none of these packages ever contain cell phones and pagers but they all contain marijuana so um, myself along with 28 other people we were indicted in the middle district of Tennessee um, which does include Nashville. And everyone pled guilty except for me. I chose to go to trial, chose to hold the government to their burden of having to prove every single element of the case. And after a five-day jury trial, I was um, acquitted of six charges and was found guilty of aiding and abetting a conspiracy to distribute 100 to 400 kilograms of marijuana. Now, I don't know if anybody here practices in federal court, but that amount of marijuana triggers automatically a mandatory minimum sentence of five years. Um, we see more mandatory minimums in the federal system than we do in the state system, right? Particularly around, um, you know, drugs. And this was in the height of the fictitious, the fictitious war on drugs at the time. And so, um, you know, I was someone who had never had any exposure to the criminal legal system, but off top, I was automatically looking at five years. Um, at my sentencing, the judge told me that um, any person of my intelligence should have known that I was dealing with something highly illegal because I was in my last semester at school at Tennessee State University majoring in criminal justice and psychology. Um, she told me that I was lucky to have been acquitted of the other charges and that I was continuing to lie to myself. And she chose to sentence me to two years above the mandatory minimum to seven years in prison. So after graduating from Tennessee State University with a degree in criminal justice and psychology, um, two weeks after graduating, I had to report to Alderson Federal Prison Camp to start serving a seven year sentence. Um, and so because I, I did go to trial, we um, still, you know, had our appellate rights and so appealed the case to the Sixth Circuit and then we had to appeal it to the Supreme Court because at this time, the federal system was kind of up in arms, right, because the Supreme Court had said that the federal sentencing guidelines were no longer 
mandatory, but were advisory. And, you know, that was, I'm, I'm with lawyers and so I can talk, <laughs> you know, how I talk. That was the Booker fan fan case. Um, and so, you know, none of the courts knew what to do because when we actually um, appealed the case to the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, they actually denied it. Then we requested an en bog hearing. We had that hearing. They granted it. Then they denied it. And then that's how we ended up with the Supreme Court. And so the Supreme Court um, granted the, um, the our appeal, sent it back to the Sixth Circuit, which then sent it back to the Middle District of Tennessee here. And so at that time, I was back in front of the same sentencing judge, and she told me that I had gotten everything that I would ever get from federal prison, but because of the mandatory minimum sentencing law, she had to send me back. So she sent me back to prison for about another 16 to 18 months at that time. And so on December 1st of 2006, I was finally released after serving three years and 10 months. Um, because there is no good time in the federal system, you serve 85% of your time. And so that was 85% of the 60 months that she had given me. Um, I started working with Peter Stryance, who was my lawyer um, throughout this. Um, when I came home, like two or three days afterwards, he hired me as his legal assistant. And I worked with him. I went to law school at NSL at night and started that in 2008, finished in 2012, and worked with Peter the whole time. And after I graduated law school, I had to go before the board for them to determine if I had the character and fitness to be a lawyer in Tennessee. And so that was a whole separate hearing. And then at the hearing, they did tell me that they usually send letters and they were going to send me a letter, but they were also going to let me know that they were going to give me my license. So in um, 2012, I was sworn in as an attorney here in Tennessee, almost like six, six days, I mean, six years to the day that I was released and started working at the public defender's office in 2013 um, here in Nashville, did that for six and a half years before I decided that I was gonna run for Congress. And, you know, it was interesting. I was talking with someone the other day doing an interview and was talking about my transition from the public defender's office to running for Congress. And I talked about the intersectionality of the issues. And it's interesting, I've seen more and more people reporting on this because it's just like, you know, we can't talk about criminal justice reform without talking about poverty. We can't talk about criminal justice reform without talking about race. We can't talk about criminal justice reform without talking about, you know, um, inadequate health care and, you know, our economy, all of those types of things. And, and that was the reason why I decided that I wanted to run for Congress, because all of these things were going on in my clients' lives and nobody was dealing with them. And so what do you do when you have a client who tells you you're reading the warrant and it says that, you know, they're arrested on a drug charge and you ask them if they want drug treatment and they say yes. And so you're filling out the form and it says that their drug of choice and you say cocaine because that's what they're caught with. And so you run this by your client and he says, no, actually my drug of choice was heroin. And I said, well, you had cocaine. And he said, well, yeah, because I don't have any insurance to be able to go to treatment. And so I felt like using cocaine was a step down from heroin because it's not as dangerous. What, I mean, what do you do? Um, you know, in, you know, I mean, I just put my pen down and, you know, and didn't, you know, just didn't know what to say. And, you know, that's just one of the, the many stories, um, you know, talking about the intersectionality of, you know, the criminal legal system and all of the other issues that our clients face. And so I ran for Congress here um, in the fifth district, um, ran against an entrenched incumbent. I think we did well. We got almost 40% of the vote. And then, um, after that, because I, I had so many people reaching out to me wanting to get their voting rights reinstated because they wanted to vote for me, even like people in Georgia. And I'm just like, yeah, you can't vote for me. I'm not, <laughs> not in Georgia. Um, but like you know, you can was, donate, <laughs> but you can't vote for me. Right. Your money. <laughs> You know, and we were already doing work around, um, you know, voting rights and felony disenfranchisement because that's some of the work that I've always been doing. But it just really highlighted that more work needed to be done here in Tennessee and around the country. And so that's what my work focuses on right now. Um, you know, right now in this country, we have, you know, over five million people who can't vote because of a felony conviction on their record. And, you know, when we look at the history of felony disenfranchisement, everything that has, you know, that was laws to keep black people from voting has been ruled unconstitutional from, you know, having to be grandfathered in, you know, from, you know, the, um, 
the literacy tests, all of those things, except for felony disenfranchisement. And here in Tennessee alone, we have 420,000 people who can't vote because of a felony conviction on their record. We are like number three, um, you know, behind like Texas and, you know, Florida, you know, if that tells you anything. Um, and so that's, that's what I focus my work on, you know, now that, and I still do criminal justice reform, but, you know, that's, that's what I do. And, and, you know, it was because of the situation that I've been in that has, you know, really um, had a hand in everything that I have decided to do since I've left prison. I, one of the terms that comes up in the book, and you really, I really noticed it at the end, and maybe it was happening sooner, is this uh, criminal legal system versus criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. When I saw it, I was like, oh, right. Um, but it was something that was, I mean, and I'm, I'm reading all the time, and yet I had not, I either hadn't noticed it before, and it's something that's being used, uh, has been used for a long time in circles that I'm just getting closer to, um, or it was something I thought, did you pen this? Um, okay, all right, but tell me about that, and do you know the history of um, when people started calling it the criminal legal system versus the criminal justice system. Well, and those of us that have been doing the work, um, you know, we have been using that terminology and you will hear people, you know, kind of move in and out of it some, you know, and even myself, sometimes I say the criminal legal system, the criminal justice system, but I do make it a point to try to say the criminal legal system as much as possible, but, you know, being a lawyer, you know, we are, you know, working in the system. So that's what it is, but, you know, there's no justice in this system. And so, um, and I think that those of us that work, um, you know, do this type of work, we recognize that. And so language matters to us. And so that is why we choose to say the criminal legal system. And you will also notice that we don't use the word felon. Um, you know, we use directly impacted um, is, you know, the terminology that we choose to use. We don't use ex-con. We don't use any of those because, you know, we really believe that people are, you know, not defined by their past and that all of us are more than the one act that we all have been accused of doing. And, you know, so language really matters to us. And, and because one of the things that we really talk about is, you um, you know, with not reforming the system, but reimagining justice, right? And so in order to do that, you have to put the humanity back into it. Mm -hmm. And putting the humanity back into it really starts with seeing the humanity in people. And when you are calling people by an act that they are alleged to have done, um, you know, you have stripped them of their humanity and their dignity. There's so many, there's so many experiences you have um, over your, um, interaction with the criminal legal system in your story where the indignity and inhumanity in execution of that treatment is it's it's so persistent it talk about if you would talk about that the first thing that comes to mind is probably the most but most simple and it, the easiest one. And that's the fact that when you were in transport um, for the resentencing, when you arrive at that facility and they hand you not even a brand new pair of panties. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's yeah. Like, wow. Mm -hmm. Even that really. Um, yeah. But I know you could give more examples um, it's so persistent. The number from that's who you are now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You literally have that experience. It sounds like a, 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 an opening sequence from a movie, but it can't escape you. That simplicity, uh, the, the lack of complexity is just as simple as this is who you are. I'm sorry I'm talking too much, but if you would talk some more about those experiences you had that just kept pushing down on you, you are not a human here. Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to give a very graphic um, example. Um, and it, you know, so you wanted to have visits, but you knew what was gonna happen after your visits, right? And so you go and you have a visit with your family and your friends and it's a good visit, but you know what's coming next in order for you to get back to the compound. You have to be strip searched. Um, and, and 
it, it wasn't just that. Like if you happen to be on your cycle, um, you would have to um, remove um, a tampon if you had one. Um, or any of those types of things. Um, and so you talk about, you know, just the level of, you know, how degrading, um, you know, something like that is, um, you know, for women, right? Uh, and so, you know, that's just one of the examples, the example of, you know, being given use underwear, um, you know, us not being called our names, you know, them telling us, you know, this is, you know, our number triple zero seventeen zero eleven was mine. Um, and, you know, saying that that's, that's who we are and that's, you know, who we have become, um, you know, being shackled and handcuffed um, to a plane, um, you know, in transport with Marshall standing, you know, in the aisle holding AK-47s. And so like, if you sneeze wrong, you know, who knows what's gonna happen, right? Um, you know, and, and those are just some of the examples, you know, that, that's in the book, but I mean, it's happening at, at facilities still today, um, you know, the lack of medical treatment. Um, there were so many women that would get sent to the medical facility and we would get word back that they had passed away. Um, one of my friends, she had had surgery, um, you know, for breast cancer and had to report not long after having that surgery and was not really given the follow-up medicine that she needed. And so she was always concerned that, you know, her cancer would come back because she was not getting follow-up treatment like, you know, her doctor recommended that she get. Um, you know, just um, the fact that, you know, there was no mental health treatment and the way that they treated it was just to you know, to give women, you know, various different medications where they're walking around, you know, like zombies. Um, you know, if you had any type of, you know, issues, their automatic thing was to send you out to the doctor and to perform a hysterectomy, um, you know, instead of dealing with, you know, what your issues were. And so there, there are numerous things. And like I said, you know, this still happens. Um, working with free hearts, we get letters all the time from women in the facility that are talking about, you know, the various different things that are happening to them. And I mean, and even just the, the laws that we have here in the state of Tennessee, where when you have a pregnant woman in custody, that she is shackled and handcuffed to the bed when she's given birth. And I mean, and, you know, I, I don't have any kids, I've never given birth, but, you know, I just, just imagine like, you know, being in this moment, um, you know, giving birth and, you know, having a guard standing there with you and being, you know, shackled and handcuffed to the bed in, in the middle of this process, you know, and, and we have filed legislation to do away with that. And, and our legislators have, you know, they've not voted for it each and every single time. So, you know, so all, so all of these things are still happening um, in the facilities, numerous things. One of the things that struck me too was, um, first of all, the first chapter is about of your book is telling about the community you grew up in, uh, whether it's uh, the the block or really centrally your family mm -hmm. and the neighborhood. Um, that community was obviously uh, formative for you. Um, the other community that I thought you described so beautifully and honestly also um, was the community you found in the prison. So even in this context where um, the uh, system is dehumanizing you, there's the experience of community that you find um, with these humans, this shared experience um, I wondered if you would share a little bit about how each of those communities have shaped who you are today and um, what can we possibly learn from what you've learned? Yes, yeah, so um, particularly from being in prison and being in community with other women who do have, um, who did have the shared experience that I had, um, you know, heard so many stories about what had happened to them. And I was blessed to have, you know, my family was able to afford a private attorney. A lot of women had federal public defenders and just really felt like that their, 
you know, attorneys were not doing anything for them, really didn't care about them, care about their, you know, case, just wanted to plead them and just move on. And, and so just hearing that and just comparing that with the type of representation I had, it was the reason why I decided that I wanted to become a public defender because I wanted to be able to provide the same level of representation that I got from my private attorney to people who couldn't afford to pay for a lawyer at all. And so that was like really one of the driving forces in wanting to become a public defender. And, you know, and I'll talk about that, you know, in the book, not only that, but also, you know, just my clients and how being a public defender that it was so humbling because, you know, I come into this with this unique experience with someone, you know, that has essentially sat in the same seat as my client is sitting in. But then there was so much that I didn't know and so much that I was able to learn from my clients. And so being a public defender, you know, we we hear all of, you know, the horror stories. We hear stories that public defenders are not, you know, real lawyers, they're public pretenders, this, that, and the other. But it was literally like one of the best jobs I've ever had. And it was so humbling. And I learned so much from my clients. Um, you know, I, I was still communicate with some of them to this day. One of them texted me just yesterday, as a matter of fact. Um, you know, and so it was it was in in those situations, but also to one of the things that I learned, and I think it's really important um, in these spaces because you know I am privileged to be in some spaces that people are not able to be in. But I may not have the necessary knowledge or experience, depending on what they're talking about. And so with being in community with other people, I am able to bring other people, you know, to the table that may not have the opportunity to be at the table. And so for me, that's really important because it's not about me being the face of, you know, this movement or any of that, you know, it's, it's about all of us. And it's about lifting each other up, you know, whenever I can, and whenever I get the opportunity to. And even, you know, once, I, you know, I came out of prison, and, I, you know, there's just this, um, this community of people that are directly impacted. And I remember when I was had just made my announcement running for Congress, but I had to go to Yale Law for their um, rebellious lawyer conference. And it was a panel of us that were directly impacted. And some of us were lawyers and some were working in, um, you know, the legal field. And it just felt so good. Like I, I was just so energized to be amongst people who understood what it was like to be a directly impacted lawyer, right? Because we can talk about what it's like to be female lawyers. You know, we see it all the time in the group, you know, the, the problems that we have in the courtrooms with being female lawyers. And then, you know, you add on top of that being, you know, a black female lawyer, right? Then on top of that, you add on to it a black female lawyer with a conviction on her record. So like I always said, I had to be three times as good as everyone else because of that. And so just being in community with people that understood that, that understood the burden, you know, that that we all carry, um, choosing to come into this field. And, but it was, it was just empowering because there were so many other people that want to be in this field. And what we were doing was that we were, you know, really talking about, you know, that there is a need for directly impacted people to be lawyers and, you know, and, and to provide that space for them to come in as well. And so, yeah, so community is really important. And I think that it, it really has shaped, um, you know, who I am and the work that I do and the work that I continue to do. We are almost at time, but I wondered if you had time for another question that might take us a little over. Oh, I'm, I'm fine. <laughs> okay, okay. So you were just talking about um, how you have, you have a burden to be three times as good, right? When I was reading your book, there's a part, and this goes to um, a type of systemic uh, racism that Okay, so we've all heard of, and I, this is, I'm going to directly quote your book on this. This is a more general understanding of uh, systemic racism that I thought was so succinctly said. Black people, this is from chapter 16, um, black people committed crimes because they were black. White people committed crimes because they needed help. I was like, oh yeah, right? Like, it was very well said. And then there's this type of systemic racism that uh, I was seeing it in your story. Um, and I think I can probably even, so let me just quickly do this page. This was when you were, 
your your uh, attorney was requesting that you be allowed out on bail before while your appeal was being considered. You were convicted of a nonviolent offense. The the charge they found was that you didn't even say that you knew what was going on. It was essentially, we just think she should have known. Mm -hmm. That was literally the charge. But because of the quantity of uh, drugs that was connected with it, it came with this mandatory sentence. He even said in the book that Peter felt, you know, as the jury came in, they kind of, somebody smiled at him and he, he thought perhaps later that they thought, hey, we got her, right? Like she didn't do this. She didn't know what was going on. We picked the one that says she doesn't have anything to do with this. Well, it still came with this mandatory sentence. Mm -hmm. Okay, so not a, not a violent crime. The, the type of nonviolent crime, the type of evidence and the charge so disconnected from any kind of danger. You literally just graduated college mid-December. You have a job at a law firm um, that you're just about to start. Mm -hmm. um, and the judge is deciding whether or not to let you just post bail while your appeal is being considered. Like, I, anyway. So she, um, oh, I guess I don't need to read that. I said all that. So anyway, she, she denies your ability to post bail and you have to go serve time. She, you find that out two weeks beforehand. And when I was reading this, I was just so stunned by how completely divorced from logic or fairness, or justice, or humanity. It just, I wrote in the book, what if she was working retail? Did her, was her success seen as a threat? I didn't know, I don't know, I just was wondering. Well, then we go a few chapters later. And um, you're talking to Amy, and this was while you're going back for your resentencing. And um, so I'll read this. Oh, Judge Trogger? That's the same judge I had, she said when I began talking about my situation. She's so great and she's so nice. Clearly, our experiences with this same judge couldn't have been more different. Amy had tried to rob a bank and freely admitted to it. And in the paragraph before you say she was completely high when she did it besides and had been given far less time to serve than I had. Judge Trogger is going to do the right thing, Kita, she reassured, re she reassured me. She'll let you go home. She's got to. And I just wrote, this reinforces my feeling that Kita's accomplishments made her more of a threat, compelling of more punitive treatment. Um, I, that's something I don't, I haven't heard a lot about or and it just struck me again, as I was reading, I was like, why is this happening to you? But my take on it was that it was thoroughly congruent with what we, what this, what the system would like to facilitate and not. Um, I'm not being very articulate, but I hope you kind of understand what I'm presenting. And I would invite you to comment on that. You do not explicitly say these things in the book. These were my observations. And I wondered if that's something that you could speak to and whether or not in your experience as a public defender, you see that sort of thing. Um, no, I mean, I think it goes back to, you know, what you read at first, um, black people commit crimes because they're black and white people commit crimes because they need help. Um, you know, there's this criminality that's attached to black people. Um, you know, and there's all kinds of research out there that shows it, right? Um, and so, you know, there's that. And so, first of all, you know, the judge has to deal with her own bias associated with that. And, and her bias was clear there, right? Mm -hmm. um, but also, too, to go to your point about, um, you know, success. So, and, and like I said, and her bias showed very clearly because, you know, I was someone who was from a two-parent household, um, was in college, was about to graduate, um, had a plan. And so in her mind, I had all of the things that black people don't have and that shouldn't and bl that black people should not have, right? Um, and that's the reality of it. And so it was if she was punishing me 
because it was just like, how dare you, you know, have these things. And then here you are, you know, in my courtroom. And so again, like I said, that was her bias. And that was her just automatically just, you know, associating my blackness with, you know, with criminality without, like you said, without the humanity, you know what I'm saying, without justice, without, you know what I'm saying, without, without even giving me the benefit of the doubt. And I mean, and even, you know, Peter talked about it in, um, in his closing where that, you know, it, it, he used like an analogy of like a, a, a white college student um, who had a roommate that had drugs and they didn't know and the room gets searched and, you know, and nothing happens to either one of them and that they're given, you know what I'm saying, the benefit of the doubt here. But, you know, you see it time and time again, um, you know, in this criminal legal system that Black people are not given the benefit of the doubt. And I mean, we can trace it, you know, we can start with, you know, with our kids when they come into the juvenile justice system, right? And that, you know, there is this adultification. Mm -hmm. um, and I talk about this because a couple of years ago doing, I think it was like the Rio Olympics, when Ryan Lochte goes down there and he's acting a fool with his friends and they're getting drunk and, you know, and they do whatever and they lie and say that the Jamaicans robbed them, right? And of course we know that the Jamaicans are black people. And then, you know, it comes out to that they made this story up that the Jamaicans did not to do this and they were just, you know, just down there just, you know, acting foolish. And so the storyline was this kid and, and he was a grown man. He was in his 30s at the time. And but he was called a kid. He was a kid. He was a kid. Right. But then, you know, we look at, you know, what I'm saying Tamar Rice, who was a kid in a park. Um, you know, that had a toy gun that was gunned down by the police. And, you know, when you read those headlines, you know, it's this young black man who really legitimately was a kid, right? And so there's all of these biases when it comes to black people that, you know, that are in the criminal legal system. And, you know, and, and I think that we have to acknowledge that, that it's there, right? And that we have to talk about it because we cannot talk about any type of reform, reimagining anything if we're not willing to talk about, you know, the, the oppression that black and brown and marginalized communities experience in the criminal legal system. And the thing is, is that I was reading something just yesterday and it was talking about this very thing and it talked about one of the insurrectionists and how um, she had posted on her Twitter or Instagram or something. It was just like, yeah, I'm not going to jail. Like I've got blonde hair and blue eyes. Like I'm not going to jail. Right. And I mean, like, that's, that's the reality. I mean, like, even she knew that, and it was that, you know what I'm saying? All of this that was driving that. Cause I mean, like, let's just look at the difference of when, like you had the black lives matters, people that were up there protesting and how they were treated you know, and they were not even anywhere near, you know, what I'm saying the capital or anything. And you have, you know, all of these insurrections, majority of them, 98% of them are white people, and they're just allowed to go in here and to do whatever they want. But if that had been black people, I mean, like, people would have been shot dead, you know, so I mean, so yeah. again, like, you know, we have to, we have to deal with this, like we, you know, we as a country have to reckon, um, you know, with, you know, with racism and with, with right, white supremacy that is running rampant in a lot of these oppressive systems and the laws have been codified, um, you know, and so that's why, you know, I do the work that I do, you know, to really change a lot of these laws. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, it's racism is there. And, and so an interesting thing, like I actually, the first time I have seen my sentencing judge um, since I've been home was a couple of months ago, I was on a panel and it was like the Women's Judges Association or something. And we were actually on a panel talking about um, race and bias and, you know, I'm saying that judges have. And she actually came in the room and she was in the room and it was the first time that I had seen her and, um, you know, was able to look her in her face and able to, you know, to, to tell her essentially like to her face, my truth and to stand in my truth. And, um, and it was interesting because she felt the need to get up at the end. Um, and she didn't, I never said who my sentencing judge was. And so she got up and she said, what did you talk about say my I'm sentencing sorry. judge? I, I never said that she was in the room, right? Oh, you did, um, like, you spoke about your sentencing. Yes. Mm -hmm, right, mm -hmm. okay, and, okay. And she I knows. Mean, 
Yes, she knew. And so she felt the need to stand up at the end and to talk about the things that she's doing in her courtroom and about playing, um, you know, like a video for the jurors about, um, you know, racism and implicit bias and how that shows up in, you know, the jury process and all of this other kind of stuff, like giving herself a pat on the back, right? But let's just be real. I mean, you say that you're showing this, you know, at your jury trials, like how many jury trials do you have? And that's for jury trials. Like, what are you doing for yourself, you know, to deal with your implicit bias? And, you know, the fact that she felt the need to get up there and to say that, you know, just lets me know that, you know, that, you know, she really hasn't changed, but she felt the need to, you know, try to rehabilitate herself because she felt maybe she felt guilty because of what I was saying. But, you know, I, I highly doubt that, you know, that 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 anything that she does in her courtroom has changed. Um, okay, so one more question. <laughs> I'm fine. <laughs> All right, one last question, because it goes to a little bit of what you were just talking about, um, the courtroom, that trial, and also uh, the adultification that you talked about. Um, tell us, tell folks who are here about the closing argument of the prosecutor in your case. Yes. So um, what did he compare you to? Yes. So the prosecutor in my case, um, he compared me to a prostitute and my female judge never said a word. Um, And yeah, gave the story. You've heard the story about the woman. Keep going. Sorry. Yes. Yes. I mean, and, and that was essentially what he did. And like I said, and she she never said a word. And so you know, it was, uh, you know, there was so many things wrong, um, you know, with, with this prosecution and, you know, and, and, you know, and prosecutors, you know, in, in general who, um, you know, abuse their powers and stuff. And, and there was clearly an abuse of power, but again, you know, we're talking about the humanity and the dignity and, you know, that's, that's what we have. I mean, but, you know, we still continue to see it today, just in closing arguments where, in the um, Ahmaud Aubrey case, where they were talking about him, and they, you know, made mention of, you know, I'm saying, like, dirty toenails or something, you know, I'm saying, I mean, that's what I'm saying. So it's just like, you know, everything is being done to really strip the humanity, you know, from black people. I mean, like, uh, you know, just compare that to what happened, you know, in the Kyle Riddingham, you know, Riddingham, House case, you know, how, you know, the judge was not even going to allow, you know, the people that he murdered to be called victims, that they had to be called rioters and looters, um, you know, and, and just how the judge was coddling him. But then, you know, here we have Ahmad Aubrey, somebody that was gunned down as he is running, you know what I'm saying, by these white vigilantes who is still dehumanized even in his death, right? Mm-hmm. You know, so I mean, like, again, like all of this is still here. This is still prevalent. I just feel like that those of us that work in this system, we have the obligation to call this out, right? And we have to stand firm in that. And sometimes we may have to call it out and stand firm on our own because, you know, you may be the only one that is willing to take that stand and to call it out. But I just feel like that we have an obligation to, to name that and to call it and to demand better in, in, you know, this system and particularly for our clients that we're representing in this system. In addition, obviously, to your book, are there, um, I'll, I'll give one. Um, I read maybe a month ago now, I finished The Black Church by Henry Louis Gates Jr. Um, apparently, there's also a PBS um, special, I think, on it as well. Um, but that was uh, a fascinating book. Um, of course, it's the story of the Black Church, but it's the story of the Black community in the mm-hmm. U.S. Mm-hmm. Um, and with its roots in slavery and how the church was managed. Um, I'll give one quick antidote. Um, they, where the churches were allowed to ha- be exist um, by the slaveholders, they would not allow the story of Moses freeing the slaves to be taught in their church. Well, of course they didn't. But did you know that? I mean, that's, there's just so much. 
um, the difference between the Northern Black churches culture and the Southern Black culture, uh, Black church culture, very different worlds. Um, the, 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 oh, one of the things I love about the Black church is it's pretty much baked into most, not all though. Um, women are, oh, women can lead, you know, that's something that the, uh, is a big distinction between the Black church and the white churches on the whole, big big broad statements, not always the case. But, um, but I found that book to be a powerful history of the US and the black experience, even where that's certainly not the subtitle, let alone the title of the book, I would highly recommend it. Um, obviously, I recommend your book. Are there any other books that you think do that you would recommend if someone's like, okay, no, but really, I do want to learn. And I not to put the burden on you, right? Like, you teach us, tell us what we need mm -hmm. to know. Mm -hmm. But as a genuine ask, is there something that you've heard from maybe even other white friends where they're like, this book kind of help, helped me get it in a way that I didn't see it before? Um, because I think there are people that would be interested in, in knowing and being able to see by learning, um, not just assuming, because everyone can tell you what to believe, right? and what's really happening. But until you really learn and educate yourself and read the stories, um, you don't you don't believe it yet. You're just adopting what you've been told. So, yeah, so I'm, yes. I'm, I'm big into, you know, like documentaries and stuff. And so I watched a documentary, I guess about a month ago, it was called, um, I think it was called The Civil War or, or Who Do We Think We Are? Okay. Um, and that was really, really good, particularly in light of, you know, where we are with critical race theory, right? And, mm -hmm. you know, what's being taught in our schools. And, you know, and there were some things that that was said, where it was one professor, and she was a white professor, and she talked about how at the end of the Civil War, you know, slavery essentially was ended and outlawed, but white supremacy was not. Mm -hmm. And she said the North and the South came together on that concept. And it is so true, you know what I'm saying? Because we are still fighting that today, right? Mm -hmm. And then there was another, um, another thing that another professor, this was a black professor and she was talking about the South. And she said, you know, she said, we would never go to Auschwitz and have a wedding. So why do we go to former slave plantations and have weddings? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I was just, I mean, like, and that was just like, just like, wow, you know, um, you know, and so I thought that that was really good just hearing um, how people think about the civil war in the South and, and really and truly that really like guides how they, you know what I'm saying, think about a lot of things to this day. Um, and then I would, you know, suggest that, you know, people that really want to learn is that they, you know, I'm sure a lot of people have already read um, White Fragility, but, um, you know, the same author has another book out called Nice Racism. Um, and it really talks about, you know, particularly the, um, you know, progressive, um, you know, white people and how they are you know, how, you know, progressive white people can really, um, you know, continue to hold this institution of racism together, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I've started reading it uh, myself, but I do think that that is a really, really good book. I think she talks a lot about um, the fact that, you know, it is not on, um, you know, Black communities to teach white people, and so her book is written for white people, and, you know, in just, you know, just a few pages that I've written, I feel like that she does a really, really good job of examining herself, right? Because she's been doing this work for years and, you know, has a lot of colleagues that are Black that have been doing this work and she's learned a lot from them, um, but how she still examines herself and still acknowledges that even with all of this knowledge that she has, that she still gets it wrong, right? And that it is something that she has to be aware of each and every single day with her interactions, you know what I'm saying, with her Black colleagues, with her Black friends, you know, being, you know, a professor, all of those things. And so I think that that is, um, I think that's a really good book for people that really want 
you know, to learn, like people who may have an idea of this um, and, and, you know, people who have a working knowledge of it, but still there is, you know, like we never get to the point where it's just like, oh, I've arrived and I don't need to, you know I'm saying, like learn anymore or do any type of self-evaluation. And so I think that's a good book that really says like, no, we can never get to the point where we've arrived, you know, on this issue. And we always need to, you know, be evaluating ourselves so that we are not, you know, perpetuating this whole cycle of racism. Um, a term that um, I came across, I don't know however long ago, um, but uh, I can't remember the name of the book it was in, but uh, anti-racist is what I'm just trying to get out, is uh, embracing not that you're going to be or can achieve not being racist, but you can be committed to and have achieved being anti-racist. It's a process. Mm -hmm. um, like literally everything that we do as humans, let alone adults, is um, always be mindful of the choices we're making and what we make those decisions based on. Um, and uh, the author that you speak of, um, and I'll be sure to do the things people do where they pull these books and add links. I'll figure that out and um, provide that information. But um, what you're, the author you spoke of, um, you didn't use this word, but this attitude of humility, you know, like that's a humble person, mm -hmm. not a down and out person, but a humble person who acknowledges that going into each interaction, there's an opportunity to get it right and be mindful and show compassion and love. And there's also an opportunity to make a mistake right? And get it wrong and even pick the wrong thing. But if you don't think you're capable of that, um, you can't learn from and change and grow. Um, there's just so much in your book um, that um, I've already doubled the time that I asked of you. And I apologize for that. And I thank you for um, uh, giving us more time than you'd plan to. Um, but whether it's about, I'm just going to run through the topics, um, the way you talk about hope, the fact that you had hope, um, and we didn't get into that, but I would love, um, uh, I'll continue to think about um, the, the ways that um, you accessed that and your faith. There's a quote in there about, you know, I didn't lose my faith, but I had to adapt. I had to change the way I viewed God. And I thought, wow if we're paying attention, probably all of us as adults are doing that. Mm -hmm. um, the, the God, no matter what faith tradition you come up in, what you are taught as a child is not typically, um, it doesn't have the, the, the buoyancy or the, that's not the wrong word, but the, the, the ability to interact with an adult world um, because you're not taught those things as kids. And then you experience this world. And uh, I was just, profoundly moved by your humility and um, embracing uh, your faith in a way that was new. And that's just so relatable. Yeah, I, mean, I, think, I think as we grow, we mature and we evolve as humans, right? And so I think that it's important that that we allow ourselves and that we give ourselves, you know what I'm saying, the space and the grace to grow and to evolve as humans. Yeah, totally. Um, anyway, again, I could go on and on. I'll, um, I will, uh, the vulnerability, the whole experience, coming back into, um, uh, but under supervision, and just this woman constantly hounding you at your work, questioning how you even got your job. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just the whole thing was just so oppressive um, it, at every single turn. And your uh, ability, your willingness to share the story, I just couldn't be more thankful for it. You say early in the story, you're in, um, I think it was, oh, it was a college class. Um, maybe that was Professor Woods. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and you would know, you're telling you, I, I studied well, I knew all the answers, but I wasn't going to be that person who was going to raise her hand and I'm not going to be the group leader. Um, you had a horrible experience um, that you could, there's a million ways that you could have all legitimate options the fact that you were willing to pick one that invited others into this bad, awful, unfair experience of yours for us to learn from it um, is such a gift. Should have never happened to you. This is no like, oh, well, you know, all things work out for good. No, that was, 
<laughs> that was bullshit. That should have never happened. Um, so not at all to take away from or put something shiny on it, but your willingness to bring that out and let us learn from it is a gift to us. And I want to thank you for doing that. Um, and uh, I just want to encourage people. I think this book and other books being intentional about educating yourself, you will be inspired. Um, uh, you know, that, that there's just so much to learn from the people around us, particularly those that don't look and have like and have the same history and experience. Um, we got a lot to learn. Um, and, um, and again, so I don't know how to wrap this up because I don't do this very often. Keita, thank you. Ms. Haynes, thank you for uh, sharing your time and your story with us. Um, I will post this wherever I can figure out how to post it, whether it's a link or the whole video. Um, and if anybody has any follow-up questions, um, I'm sure you'll be able to find Kita. Kita, where do people find you? Um, so I am on um, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter as Kita Haynes. And um, my website is www.ketahaines.com. Um, and you, you can go there and there's a link um, where you can purchase a book if you want to purchase it. It gives you several options uh, where you can purchase it. Um, and um, yeah, you can shoot me a message. Um, I, I respond on, on all social media. Um, so yeah, so um, you know, if you have any questions, um, just reach out. Thank you, Kita. And thanks to everyone for participating in this. And thank you to our future people who went back and watched the video. Um, just really appreciate everyone. And uh, thank you, Kita. Thank you thank so, you. so much. Thank right. you. Bye, Bye, everyone. Bye.